Mike Owens here, joined today by John Fitch, MMA welterweight legend, who's now turned the fight from into the UFC towards the UFC with his class action lawsuit alongside Kung Lee, uh, Nate Quarry, and many others. John, how are you, my man? Doing really good. Really, really good. We had, uh, you know, still riding high off of this judge's uh, decision over the class certification. Now we're just continually pushing, uh, waiting, hoping that Mark Wayne Mullen, Senator now, Mark Wayne Mullen, will and reintroduce the Muhammad Ali Act, and we can start getting after that again also. 100%. Just obviously that, that news is broken. I, I, I presume a lot of MMA fans have seen that headline about being granted class certification. For those who don't know, what does that actually mean and how big of a step is this in the case? So originally me, Kung Lee, and the other guys, uh, is six of us, filed suit against the UFC to say, hey, we have all been damaged, and we're saying that we're, we were damaged in the same way as all of these other guys, 1,214 people. We're all damaged the same way. So the first part of the case in the trial was the judge deciding whether or not we were actually a class, if we were all damaged uh, in the same way with the same practices. Uh, we had two uh, kind of lawsuits going at the same time. One was the identity class. One was the bout class. The identity class covered... Um, sponsors, um, uh, merchandising agreements, video game agreements, that stuff. The judge declined that we were damaged the same way uh, in that. So that class got thrown out, which I have a problem with, because if you don't have the bout class monopoly, you can't get the, you can't get the other one. You can't have yeah. one without the other. So I'm kind of, I am upset with that. It's kind of garbage, mm -hmm. but whatever. Um, the other one, the bout class is saying that our, um, the fights, the bouts that we actually competed in, the contracts were illegal and that we were, you know, manipulated and exploited and we were saying we're all damaged the same way. The judge agreed with that. Um, even, you know, I'll, I'll read you what the judge said about the contracts. Uh, so, so, yeah, this is it. <clears throat> right, yeah, he goes, uh, the courts find that the platelets have established that uh, that defendant willfully engaged in anti-competitive conduct to maintain or increase their market power. This was mainly accomplished um, in three ways. First, through the enforcement of exclusionary contracts, which kept fighters locked up in the anti-competitive manner. Second, through extra uh, contractual methods to make fighters' uh, contracts effect effectively uh, perpetual. And third, uh, through acquisition of shutting down right of, uh, rival rival competition. This is back back uh, you know ten years ago they bought up all the competition. Maybe what was the other thing? But basically, the the judge uh, ruled. He said that the he found that the contracts that we signed because all that's the big argument. People said you don't won't, don't like the deal. Don't sign the contract. Well, guess what? You're an idiot if you think like that. The yeah. judge said that the contracts were anti competitive and. Um, uh, uh what do you call it coercive right so a coercive contract is illegal so the contracts are null and void that's that's what we're trying to prove and that they had stolen from us and we, we need to reclaim the the uh that money stolen from us and damages so those three sp sp specific points let's just go through them again there was can you can you just repeat them for me please um one was uh i'm sorry which the other one um through enforcement of exclusionary contracts, which kept fighters locked up. So right? exclusionary contracts, then you had clauses in the contract to elongate. Is that correct? That that was one one part of it. Um, uh, extra contractual uh, methods to make fighters' contracts effectively perpetual. That was the part where, you know, like the championship clause. Yeah. Like you win the belt, you're, you're automatically forced to re-sign another contract and defend it for them. Yes. When, when you're at, that's like, you're at your, your peak wealth, you're at your peak worth. I mean, not wealth, but your peak worth. So you should be able to be a free agent and see how much money you can get for your next fight. And then the third was buying up all the competition. So of, of those three, which one do you think affected your career most when you look back? Um, Man, well, the, the exclusionary contracts, right? Because part of those exclusionary contracts is the fact that they own the title. Right, because the UFC owns the title and exclusionary contracts, that makes it no longer a sport, because they control ascension to title, they control rank, they control everything. That's not sport. That's a that's a that's pro wrestling. Yeah. 
What, what you've just talked about there is interesting because there is a lot of the casual audience who refer to UFC as MMA. We had a lot of that, you know. I, yeah, I tr- that's how I tr- these people are such noobs. It's NHB to me. Mm. No holds barred. That's how old I am. Yeah. Like you people who call UFC, like you're so fresh and green and have no idea what you're talking about. Like, I don't even, I don't even take yeah. anything you say into consideration. No, of course. You're, you're a baby. You're a baby. <laughs> no, but I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is we, we still have that kind of sentiment in the sport. So I guess what I'd like to ask is, is this a UFC problem or do you think it's a wider sport problem? I.e. A, the likes of Bellator, PFL, one championship. Well, one, they, of, they one of the things the that things? Yeah, one of the things that happens in a monopoly, everybody else who operates in that same system, that same market, has to adopt the the business practices of the monopoly, or they they just can't survive. Um, but what you'll get is gimmicks. You'll get a lot of gimmicks, and then that's why you, uh, um, you have uh, PFL doing tournaments. It's a gimmick. You know, um, they're just trying to say, hey, we're kind of different. But th- the thing is, they have to do a gimmick because they can't really compete because all the top guys, all the top talent are locked up with another organization. And that organization also owns the title. So you can't even you can't even have somebody compete for their title. Uh, I know that this is this class certification has taken five, five and a half years to actually be granted. I know the case has been going on since in 2014. Why specifically has that taken so long to get that class certification? That's our legal system. It's the American legal system. Um, you can pay to stall things as long as possible. And I think that's that's one of the things UFC has done. Um, you know, uh, going public, I think, is one of the things, too. They, they draw it, drew it out. And, man, so, okay, let's go way back. Word gets out that class action lawsuit's coming. So for Tita's and everybody, they start prepping they start realizing, hey, we can't do this forever. We're breaking the law. Somebody's going to crack down on us eventually. So what do they do? They start prepping and making everything look great so they can sell it off to some other sucker who's going to have to take the rap for the lawsuits. They do that at WME. And then um, I mean, he's like, oh, crap. We don't want to have to take all this pay and, and be responsible for it. Let's go public and get investors to come in. So they're going to af- end up fleecing the investors um, who, are, who are buying into this. You know, They're going to pass the buck over over to somebody else nobody's actually going to step up and and take responsibility for their illegal actions right okay um obviously as i mentioned there nine years in the making so we're, we're very much in a different place from when this case was initially launched in 2014 and 2023 in, in terms of the legal system and, and also where the sport is in both a kind of popularity sense and also just in a general state mm-hmm. so what is your overall opinion of the current and then they landscape has th- have things changed? Have they gone better? Have have they gone worse? Where do you what do you look at now? No, it's yeah, I think it's gotten way worse. It's gotten way worse because within that monopoly that UFC owns, you, it creates underneath monopolies underneath it, right? So like everybody, everybody gets locked into place. It cuts out all competition. Journalists no longer have to really compete anymore because certain journalists are already buddy buddy with the ufc they already do pr work for the ufc they won't ever say anything bad about the ufc so they get preferential treatment they're locked into a nice space cozy space where they don't have to really compete with smaller journalists like yourself who Mm -hmm. might not have the resources they do Mm -hmm. so they the monopoly actually screws you over too because it's locking you out of the market and being seen by a larger audience right that happens with management also so now you have managers who have over a hundred clients. They have a management company that has hundreds of clients. They cannot uh, do a, a fiduciary thing. They cannot meet their fiduciary responsibilities with that many clients. Other professional sports limit the amount of manager, uh, limit the amount of athletes a manager can manage. You, you won't see 300 guys being managed by one person or one group. I did, I did want to make... up... Sorry, go on. Sorry. But... No, well, because you end up, you end because you end up in yeah the monopoly, so you end up having managers who become cozy with the monopoly runner, the UFC, and doing favors for them, screwing over their athletes so they stay in good favor with the UFC. You know, the UFC doesn't like a guy. The management team will start not giving that guy fights, not offering that guy fights because oh, we don't want to make the we don't want to make the boss mad. Everybody ends up working for who's running the monopoly. I'm not sure if you've seen the work that the YouTube channel MMAI has done on some of those manager uh, monopoly kind of subjects, but he's talked about, he's done the work on potentially looking at, or specifically looking at the Dana White Contender Series roster mm. and how yep. certain management companies, I think Iridium is one, is, who's uh, largely uh, 
implicated in that uh, yep. the the ratio of iridium uh athletes. yeah iridium i have gotten you know i made a statement uh with jimmy smith i did a re-interview recently on sirius and i talked about you know the we're hoping that a lot of the stuff gets released there's over a million documents right and a lot of those documents are our managers screwing over their their athletes but not all of those documents a lot of those documents aren't pertinent to the case so they don't they're not going to get added to the case so they're not going to ever see the light of day well i said i managed i said a comment on that on jimmy smith's show and then i get flooded with people who are represented by iridium and and how dirty and and slimy they are and how they're getting screwed over by their own managers. Wow. It's ugly. It's it, people have no idea how ugly this this is. People want to say talk smack about boxing. Boxing looks like Jesus compared to what MMA is. Do you think the fan base cares enough about these issues? Like do you think that no. the, the average no, fan actually care cares? They, they don't care fans. And, and that's the thing that we have to talk to fighters a lot about because they're too worried about what the fans think. The fans don't care. They're going to watch the fights no matter what. They're going to bitch and complain no matter what. In all of sports history, when the athletes rose up to fight against the owners who were screwing them over, the fans 100% of the time, 100% of the time sided with the rich owners. They never sided with the athletes. The average fan is like, well, you guys are playing a game for money. I wish I could do that. Most people would do it for free just because they want the clout or they want to be seen or they think it would be fun. Well, we're professionals who've dedicated our entire life. I started wrestling at nine, hmm. right? This isn't something I just decided to do when I was an adult and be like, you know what? I want to go try that. I started at a young age to be the best athlete and and wrestler and, and fighter that I could be. And to have somebody come in and, and, uh, not allow me to compete because oh i don't like your style it's not a sport so how do we change the fans opinion of that we don't care so it's sorry so it's I, sorry fans but like you caring about how much money i'm making does not affect me i do not care what you think right i fought for them i fought the fighters deserve 50 percent of the revenue period i don't care what you think about it screw yourself i don't care i really do not no, I, 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 guess, I guess I don't mean that. I guess in terms of public opinion, in terms of trying to drive this case forward, having the fans on your side would obviously be a benefit. It doesn't. I mean, they don't matter. I'm sorry okay. to say it too. They don't matter. Their opinion, no matter what happens, it's the, up to the judge. It's up to the courts. Yeah, it's up course. to the legal system, yeah. right? They can be uh, crabby and, and shitty about it all they want. Boo hoo hoo. I don't care. They're breaking the law. The UFC did not come to prominence because they're hard workers and they did a great job. They cheated. They're criminals who stole from people. They belong. I believe they belong in prison. No, I guess I guess you're completely right in terms of the fight. The book stops with the judge. I guess I mean from a PR uh, standpoint, but obviously as you allude to now, it's but, that, but that's the what a lot of a uh, lot of fighters they they get hung up on. Oh well, the fans will the fans. Will, it doesn't matter. These people are not going to take care of you when you're old and have CTE. They're not gonna they're not gonna pay for your hip replacement surgeries. They're not gonna pay for your arthritis treatments. It's not happening. They will never be there for you. They'll still wait in line to get an autograph from you when you can barely hold the pencil yeah, and you're shaking sure. from Parkinson's or something. They'll do that, but they're not, they're not going to pay for your medical bills. So take care of yourself now. Screw them. Yeah, no, that's completely true. And I guess you've, you've kind of mentioned the, the fighters. And I know that on your website, you talk about 1,214 athletes. I think you previously referenced that you're, that you're re uh, representing, if you like, throughout this case. Do you receive support from the other fighters on the roster who you are technically representing, whether that be uh, behind closed doors or not? Do you get much support from the rest of the roster? I get I get some people uh, who will talk behind closed doors, but that that's kind of even stopped because a lot of people are afraid to be associated with me or be around me, mm -hmm. right? Um, I got one text from an old teammate <laughs> after we got the class certification, and it wasn't a congratulatory. It was, it was just joking about whether he got a piece or not. Right. Yeah. People like there is a, a severe case of Stockholm syndrome with a lot of these people. They identify and love their abuser. And they, I, I just don't understand it. I don't get it. So I guess kind of my next question from that, and this is a very uh, difficult question. So I don't mean any offense when I say this, but it seems, it seems obvious. But I guess why do this? 
And what I mean by that is, is, is this a selfish endeavour? Do you feel like you're wrong? Do you feel like you're trying to get something back that you're owed? Or are you trying to change the sport for the better long term? Uh, well, there, there's there's uh, multiple multiple layers to this. One mm. is I love fighting. I love the sport of fighting, but I hate what it's become. I don't like pro wrestling. I freaking hate it. I think it's gross, mm. right? When I was a little kid, I loved it. And then I went to my first wrestling practice, right? I had a bunch of those uh, WWE rubber dolls. I went to my first wrestling practice and I realized I was like, pro wrestling's fake. I went home. I was so pissed. I cut all the dicks off of those pro wrestlers, threw mm. them away. I was done with it gross I, a bunch of fake weenies acting like you're tough guys i hated it i still hate it mm -hmm. right so i love fighting because it was the realest thing you could you could get and and there was a free market before the ufc started taking things over in like 2010 when our case began because you had multiple organizations that you could go to and they, they paid similarly uh but most importantly the contracts were short most yeah. contracts were one to three fights Right. That gave you a lot of mobility to travel and leave around. G, uh, 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 BJ Penn left the UFC, went and fought mm -hmm. Rumble the Rock because they could yeah. pay him more. Yeah. Like that was a thing that was possible back then. But then as the UFC started getting more money and gaining more prominence, uh, they started buying out other people. And around that time, you know, 2008, 9, 10, they really started changing. Like the way they treated the athletes, the way they behaved, everything just got like icky. And I was like, this ain't right. Something's off. Something's wrong. So I want to be able to watch something I enjoy again without being disgusted. I have to watch the fights now with the volume off because all the, all the, it sounds like a, you know, you ever play one of those video games. It's a boxing video game and mm. it just has canned, it has canned things that the announcers just say all the time. Yeah. Right. And they just replace in, you just, they just replace in your name or your whatever thing. That's what it sounds like to me today. It's gross. They say the exact same things. They push the same guys. It's so obvious, like who they're pushing, who they want to win. I can't stand it. So like, I want to be able to watch a sport I enjoy again. That's one thing. Two, I've got so many friends that I, I, uh, and colleagues that I respect who are, who are jacked up. Their lives are jacked up. Their bodies jacked up. They sacrifice their long-term health to put on a show and can, and compete for uh pray and, and compete for belts and compete for ranks. And they've got nothing to take care of themselves now. They had a large amount of money stolen from them, stolen, straight up stolen from them. They did the work, but they didn't get paid for their work. So that really bothers me that I have, you see guys out here. I remember Mark Coleman years ago had to uh, crowdfund in order to get like money for a hip replacement surgery or something. Mm. Yeah. Right. The UFC still pushes him around and uses his image and sells his videos and and uses him on fight pass to make money they're still making money off his back but he's got no long-term care at all situations like that i think man phil baroni's rotten in a in a mexican prison right now i think if phil would have been taken care of early on in his career he wouldn't have gone down that rabbit hole or down that spiral right there's mm -hmm. stefan bonner what's happened with step what happened with mm -hmm. stefan bonner and his career and his life a lot of those things you know, because of the actions of the UFC and guys not making the money they should have made, like their whole lives are screwed up. And I, those guys deserve, not deserve, those guys have earned their money. They earned their money already. This is back pay. This is money that's owed to them. And I think they they just, they they need to have it. Yeah. <laughs> that's a big part of it. Yeah. Um, but the personal, there is a personal aspect of it too, but that's the least amount, least important thing, you know? Um. But yeah, as a sport, because that's where my initial beef was. This is a sport. In every sport, every single sport in the world, you win, you move forward. You win, you move forward. That's it, right? It's not, oh, yeah, you won, but we didn't like how you won, so we're putting you at the bottom again. We decided, well, you know, you, you didn't sign the contract we wanted you to sign, so we're not going to give you the rank. We're going to sit you for nine months because you turned down a fight, and we don't like that. That that needs to end. It needs to end. Yeah, no, hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. Um, obviously, when you look back on your career, I do know that you had your post UFC career, so I do know that you went on to accomplish other things outside of the promotion. But having said that, at the particular moment of your UFC career, because we are talking UFC specific here, at the particular moments of your UFC career, when you look at what what you're fighting now in two thousand twenty three, if those measures were in place, 
would have been different. Or the particular point that you look at and go, that that moment would have been yes, one one hundred percent. I lost. I, I I went undefeated for a very long time. Was ranked number two in the world for a number of years. I don't know anybody who's been ranked number two. Uh, or or the number one contender yeah, for as long that. as I was. I don't think anybody ever has. Yeah. Um, I had like 14 whatever type winning streak. I lost a decision. Decision to GSP, right? Because I thought I was going to knock him out because two fights ago, Matt Sarah knocked him out. I didn't try to wrestle that fight. I didn't, I, I wasn't my game plan to wrestle that fight. It was a big mistake. Um, I go on to win five more fights after that. If it would have been a real sport, <laughs> I would have fought for a title again after those five wins probably before those five wins after three wins i probably should have been given a granted title shot i probably should have been given bigger names in in, in some of those situations i should have fought carlos uh Conant. i should have fought martin campman i should have fought jake shields they had plenty of guys the big names that i should have fought then but they prevented that because they didn't they didn't like me because i wouldn't bow down and get on my knees for them you know, like I'm the guy who first pushed back against the merchandising agreement. I'm the guy who pushed back against the the, the video game agreements. Like I had I had constitutional law. I had a constitutional law class in freaking uh, college, part of my history degree. And we covered we covered uh, antitrust stuff for a while. You know, we, we, we covered that. We covered uh, the union busting man. Like so like I could feel something was very wrong. Uh, and I think one of the biggest triggers for me that was telling me that something's very wrong was when GSP had to get on his knees and beg for a title shot. Mm. Has Tom Brady ever had to get on his knees and beg for a, a shot at the Super Bowl title? No. Can, does uh, Messi, what's the uh, soccer uh, title, right? Mm. Any yeah. of these guys have yeah. to get on their knees and beg a commissioner for a shot? No, they won. They won, they moved forward. That's how sports work. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Obviously, in terms of these issues that we're talking about, in terms of fighters versus the UFC, obviously a large talking point over the last 12, 18 months has been the Francis Ngannou situation. Obviously, now mm-hmm. signing with PFL is, is now obviously scheduled to face Tyson Fury next month. It's amazing. Is I, I did want to ask about that. Is that a particular benefit to you guys? And if so, what? And if, or just generally, what are your overall thoughts um, on the whole? In a, in a sense... It's kind of a win for man. They keep they they've been screwing themselves over so bad this whole process. Um, so because of the lawsuit, they put in the the uh, um, the sunset clause. They started putting in the sunset clause of the contracts to be like, hey, look, we're not we're not monopoly. You know, eventually the contracts wear off. Mm-hmm. Well, Con- Naganu took advantage of that. Like he leveraged it. After he did that, though, guess what? Contracts have been changed back. There's no more sunset clause. Right. Like, should, should, should do you think that the like I've asked a lot of people about this. Do you think the Francis and Francis and Garno situation can change MMA? Do you do you feel like that can be a benefit to you guys, or or if not, do you think it can change? I, no, I, uh, it's it's another you know straw in the camel's back. I think it opens people's eyes up to what is possible. Other fighters are like, oh wait, like I can actually make real money. I can make boxing type money if I'm not under this heel on my neck. Wow. I think that's definitely the whole thing with the, uh, the circus fights, the, the, what, what's some, the douchebag bros, um, Logan, Logan and Jake Paul clip face. Yeah. Um, those two goobers, like what they're doing is even, um, shining a light on this stuff because the UFC's mantra the whole time is you're not important. No one cares about you. They're not watching the fights for you. They're watching it for the UFC. People pay to watch the UFC, not you. Well, now we're seeing that's bullcrap. The fighters are seeing it's absolute bullcrap. Fans pay for the fighters. Fans pay for the name. That's why the that's why the that's why the fight promotions use the fighters' names and their pictures on the on the promotion. That's why they use them on the video games. Like if it wasn't about the fighters, they wouldn't have to use the fighters' names to promote their brand. Yeah, of course. Of course. Last one from me, John. I do appreciate you're a very busy man, and I thank you for your time and going so detailed into these subjects. Uh, I do realize they're very personal to you, so I do appreciate your your kind of explanations of all of these. Um, for a casual fan who's listening to this, who maybe doesn't understand what's going on specifically to the case, can you kind of give me a broad or an idealistic sense of what your idyllic uh, landscape of the MMA world would be? 
Well, we need a free market, right? And in in and in that um that means that fighters need to be able to challenge for titles and own titles and own their ranks, regardless of what promoter they fight for. We have two, two scenarios where we can fix things. One is that the, the promotions give up their titles and they, and they find sanctioning bottle bodies, sanctioning bodies to control titles. So we have a third party independent party who controls titles, which any promoter can compete for. Uh, and though they also control rank, it's third party uh, titles, third party ranks. The other option, and this may come from injunctive relief from the case, the judge may decide this happens. But if the judge decides you, you the promoters can keep their titles, but they're only allowed to hold contracts for one year. That opens the door up too, because now, okay, yeah, I fought, I bought the, I fought, I won the UFC title. I'm going to sit out until my year is up. And then I'm going to go on the market and see who the highest bidder is. So it's time and it's ownership, essentially. Time, uh, ownership of your own time and ownership of, of the title. Those are the two options, essentially. Because that's, that's what most people really need to understand is that the UFC and fight promotions are not leagues. They are not leagues. Mm. They're lying to you when they put league in the title of the name or they say league. It's not. You have to have multiple owners, sanctioning body that mm. keeps the title and the rank separate from the from the owners. Um, I'm sorry. What was I? I drew a blank. No, I was, I was just saying. I was just saying that the two main factors are either owning your own time or owning. Oh, time. okay. I'm sorry. Yes, and um, yeah. So the titles, like in um in boxing, you own the title, you own the rank. Like mm -hmm. there is, there's there's cases. There are cases where boxers sued to keep their rank because they left the promoter. Right. We know that. Uh, and the mistake, oh, that's what I was saying. The mistake that most people make is that they think, you know, we're employees. That the UFC is a league, and we're employed by this league. It's not a league; it's a promotion, and we are independent contractors. The promotion works for us. We're supposed to employ them. We're supposed to pay them to promote us. It's not the other way around. They're not in. They're not employing us to fight for them. We're paying them to promote our fight. That's what's supposed to happen, but it's backwards now. The UFC uses the fighters' names to promote their brand, and, and they treat the athletes like employees. We're not. We're on oh, the same level, if not above. It's like a serv they're a service provider. Promoters are a service provider. You know what else is a service provider? Your cell phone company. Yeah. What would what would you do if your cell phone provider started acting like Dana White? Yeah. You'd find a new cell phone company. I think that might be the best metaphor for us to leave of my viewership on that, that, that very visceral uh, metaphor of, of what you just kind of described there. John, I really appreciate your time and I really appreciate you going into such uh, great detail about all this, about all this information regarding the case. Yeah, if there is, if there isn't, if there is any way I or others can help, please, please let us know how we can help or how we can contribute to the course. Uh, go to johnfish.net, sign up for the newsletter. I do a lot of uh, online coaching. I have programs and stuff. I have a, the Gumroad website. I put up programs for that fitness, nutrition, uh, wrestling, MMA. I have my own fight system, Fitch Smash uh, fight system. Um, I do seminars. So, you know, I'm available. Check out, follow my social media, watch my social media shows and stuff like that. And uh, and I got a, I got a podcast. I do Sunday nights uh, live at seven uh, on the left coast on California time. People can uh, tune in that too. Thank you for your time, John, once again. And I wish you the best of luck going forward with the case. Right, Thank you, Michael.